Thank you so much, Pastor Dameron. Let me invite you to open your Bible to the book of Luke in chapter number 7. The book of Luke in chapter number 7 this morning, and I'd like to begin reading from Luke chapter 7, verse number 37. And what a privilege it is to be at Fairhaven Baptist Church. I'm thankful for your testimony. I'm thankful for your love for Christ and, and for the wonderful heritage here and your heart and your desire to see the Lord do great and mighty things. My, I heard a tremendous testimony this morning and it kind of dovetail in that beautiful chorus, one of my favorite songs we sang today and you never hear it anymore, When the Lord Saved Me. Something wonderful happened when the Lord saved me. And that's what a testimony is, talking about what happened when the Lord saved me. Everything changes. And I appreciated that so much. Thank you for the good singing this morning, the music, the special, the choir, the orchestra. Uh, just a tremendous way to honor our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm looking forward to these days. My, uh, the preacher's so right. We are in desperate need of God doing a mighty work of revival in our hearts and in our lives. I don't think we have to watch much of the news before we shake our head and say, you know, the wheels are coming off. And if anybody thinks Washington, D.C. is the answer, well, that's not going to work. And, and uh, all the philosophies and all the new programs and all the new ways. And yet the answer is found in an old, old book that hasn't changed. An old, old book that stands the test of time. How we desperately need to return to God's Word. So I'm so grateful and thankful for the privilege to be here in these days. Have been praying with you that God would do great and mighty things above what we even know to ask or think. God bless you this morning. You have your Bible to the book of Luke in chapter number 7. In the chronology of the New Testament, had we followed the steps of the Lord Jesus right before we come to this story in the Bible, we would have heard the Lord Jesus lift up his voice and preach the invitation. I mean, it's one of the favorite things for Christ to do. It's found in Matthew chapter 11, 28, where the Savior stretched out his arms and said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest for your souls. There's Jesus doing what Jesus loves to do. His arms are wide open. And why? It's one of his favorite words. It's one of the New Testament favorite words. It's that word come. He never points somewhere and tells a sinner, go and be saved. He always invites the sinner to come and be saved. Because he's the one who did the work. He's the one who paid the entire price. There is the Lord Jesus with his arms wide open. And inviting sinners to come and be saved. Well, what Jesus says with his tongue, now in Luke chapter 7 and verse number 37, he is going to demonstrate with his life. So if you're able physically this morning, could I invite you to stand together with me as we go to Luke chapter 7 and verse number 37. And please understand, as we come to this story in the Bible, there is a great choice that we have to make. We can choose to look at this story through American eyes. And if we do, we might yawn a little bit. We might smile and say, isn't that nice? And, and then we're on our way to lunch. But if we look at these, this story through the eyes of a Jewish person in the New Testament, you're going to find one of the most intense and dramatic stories you've ever heard. And it begins like this. And behold, what a great Bible word. That's God's word of saying, I know you humans. And I know you'll start reading something and 15 minutes later you'll have to stop and say, what was I reading? Let me do this again. So that word beholds there to save us some time. It's God's getting our attention. And of all things for the Bible to say, and behold a woman in the city which was a sinner. Father in heaven, we ask for your help as we open the words of our God I pray that our hearts would be still, that our ears and our minds and our thinking would be open. And Lord, may you do a mighty work in this place, in this hour. For someone who has never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what a wonderful day to call upon the name of the Savior and be born into your family. Now for your people, may the word of God stir our hearts. We ask you to do a powerful work of revival. In the strong and powerful name of Jesus we come. Amen. Thank you so much. Please be seated. 
In verse number 36, the Lord Jesus Christ has an invitation to dinner. The Bible says, and one of the Pharisees. And a little bit later in the story, we'll catch his name. His name is Simon. And the Bible says one of the Pharisees desired him uh, that he would eat with him. Now, had we started in Luke chapter 1 this morning and made our way to this verse, had we been counting at home, and I'm not sure why we would be, this is the seventh time that Pharisees show up in the book of Luke. And had we started in Luke 1, as soon as we saw that word Pharisee, there would be a reaction. Something inside would say, uh-oh, here we go again. Because the first six times that Pharisees show up in the book of Luke, well, it is a disaster every time it's tried. And so now when we come to verse 36, our thinking has already gone in that direction. Here's another one of these religious specialists. Here's another one of these Pharisees. They are the constant enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Pharisees, and this wouldn't have worked a couple of years ago, but it kind of works perfectly now. The Pharisees are what you would call the religious establishment. There's something about that word establishment. Establishment, You know, it kind of says, been there a little too long, think they're a little more important than they really are, have taken on a little more power than they ought to. Uh, well, that may describe some people in our country, but it's certainly described the Pharisees in the New Testament. While they started out as a, actually a good organization, some people think that Dr. Ezra may have been the first original Pharisee. And, and if you know anything about Ezra, that man was a godly man. And though the Pharisees started started out as an organization of men who love their Bible and they love their family and they love their God. You give it enough time and organizations have the way of becoming very political. And by the time Jesus had come on the earth, why the Pharisees had taken upon themselves to be the religious bosses. Why they were the ones who said, if you want to go to heaven, we're going to tell you how to get there. You remember in the Bible, Jesus gave us or God gave us 10 commandments. Actually, 613, who's counting? But everybody thinks of 10. And when God gave Moses 10 commandments, God put it on two tables of stone. They were so small that Moses could carry them in his hands. He wrote them on the front. He wrote them on the back. I mean, they weren't very large tables of stone that Moses carried. So God gave his Ten Commandments, and he put it on two tables of stone. Well, the Pharisees took it upon themselves to t tell people, what they think God meant to say but forgot to say. And by the time the works of the Pharisees were written down, it was a few centuries after Jesus had come, by the time they wrote it down, it was massive. Their rule book was three times the size of the entire Bible. I mean, to tell you folks, their rule book was so massive, it was half the size of the U.S. tax code. Their rule, I can do one better than that. Their rule book was so huge, it was bigger than a rule book in a Bible college. And I got to tell you, that is saying something. I mean, the Pharisees had rules for everything. They had rules on how to wash your pots and wash your pans, how to wash your hands and wash your feet, how to wash everything except on how to wash your heart. I mean, Pharisees had rules that governed every single area of your life. And by the time we come to the first century, people in Israel were convinced we have to follow the rules of the Pharisees or we have no chance of heaven. No wonder the Pharisees became the mortal enemies of the the Lord Jesus Christ because when you listen to the Bible and when you listen to the Christ of the Bible you realize again and again that salvation is not by works of righteousness which we have done how many times I believe there's more than a hundred and hundred and ten verses that come to this place where we realize in the New Testament salvation is not by works not by works not by works no one is ever going to boast in heaven I'm here because I was a church member. I'm here because of how much money I gave. I am here because of the good deeds that I have done. No, sir, when you come to the Bible, you realize sinners need a Savior. No one will work their way to heaven. But when you look at the Son of God, you are looking at the way, the truth, and the life. No wonder the Pharisees, these pictures of religion, these stalwarts of the way that said, we will tell you the good works to do to impress God. No wonder they are the enemies of Christ. But when you come to verse 36, I mean, at least for a moment this morning, the lights go on. And you start thinking, well, the first six times the Pharisees show up, it's a disaster. 
But you know, maybe, maybe this time there's a ray of hope. Because after all, Simon the Pharisee has invited the Lord Jesus to come to his house for dinner. Now, when you or any American invites somebody to their house, there's a certain way to do this, a protocol. You know, we invite somebody to our house, we kind of meet them at the door, shake their hand, you hang up their coat, you give them a place to sit, and maybe a glass of water, a cup of coffee. There's a certain way you would welcome people into your home for dinner. And so that was true 2,000 years ago, because what we have in Luke 7 is the story of an honored guest being invited. It really is an unusual thing, because... You and I would imagine something very different. We would imagine the Thanksgiving setting. You know, the candles are lit. The fine china is out. I mean, you and I imagine a very private banquet, a very private dining room. But in Bible times, an event like this was a very public event. They literally would go out into the courtyard. They would make a special table that was very low to the ground. And as strange as it might seem, they would open the gates and they would invite the entire community to come and watch the special people as they would eat. I know it sounds kind of strange, but anybody who was anybody, they'd just come and they'd fill up that courtyard and they'd kind of line up around the table. The poor people would come, anybody would come. The beggars would come in hopes that some food scraps were left behind. And that's why this lady is here. Everybody has come into the courtyard. They are surrounding the table and they are waiting for the moment when the guest of honor arrives. And of course, in, on this case, case, that would have been our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Now, there were things that were expected. The crowd has gathered. Everybody's in the courtyard. Their eyes are on the gate. And when the guest of honor arrives, you would expect the host to be there. The host would give a kiss of welcome. We do a handshake. I like our way better than their way. What can I tell you? The host gives a, a kiss of welcome. Then he would call for a servant who would bring a basin of water. Everyone walks through the hot, dusty Mediterranean desert then. So, so the, the servant would come and wash the feet of the honored guest. Next, a maid would bring a basin of olive oil. The guest was invited to dip his fingers in the oil. And, and in the hot desert sun, he could put some oil in his forehead or the back of his neck and find some relief. But it was protocol. It was how you do this. You show respect and you show honor to this invited guest. You give the kiss of welcome, the water for the feet, and you put the oil upon the head. And when Jesus shows up and every eye turns to the gate, all of these things are missing. And all of a sudden, the story comes into view. You see, what Mr. Simon had done was invite the Lord Jesus Christ to come so that he could disgrace him and humiliate him. Because if an honored guest were to come, show up, the crowd was present, and basically it'd be a big old D-Y-K-W-I-A. That would be Google for do you know who I am? And have no one, no one is here to greet me. Nobody is here to give me some oil. Nobody is here to wash my feet. Well, it would be expected that the honored guest would get offended. And he would walk off in a rage and say, obviously, I am not welcome here. And you can almost imagine Simon and his buddies off in the corner. They think we're going to set him up now. And when Jesus comes, we're going to humiliate him and disgrace him. And then when he walks away in a rage, we'll come out and say, see, that's not the Son of God. Hey, that's not not the Messiah. The Christ would never behave like that. I look at the hubris and the arrogance and the pride. Obviously, that is not the Son of God. You know, you're never going to win when you're trying to come against Christ for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is Jesus knew what they were going to do before they knew what they were going to do. And so, could I say, Jesus does a very American thing. In verse 36, he, he went into the Pharisee's house. Night, there's nobody here to welcome me, nobody here to greet me. Instead of getting offended, instead of walking away in a rage, could I say he does a very American thing. It says that he sat down to meet. I love that. Oh, Jesus kind of looks around and says, okay, nobody here to do anything. I get my time to get a bite to eat, you know? And I don't know, maybe they had little name tags. And Jesus found the right place to go, and he sat down and said, let's eat. I just love that. I mean, they're not going to trip him up, and they're not going to embarrass him. They're not going to humiliate the Son of God. Why, in an instant, the Lord Jesus just turned the apple cart upside down, and all the best laid plans of the Pharisees go up in smoke. I mean, it's just a beautiful thing. Nobody getting offended, nobody getting angry. Jesus sits down and says, let's get a bite to eat. And while certainly Jesus didn't get offended, there was someone who did. 
Would you notice in verse 37, the Bible introduces us to the key player in this story with the words, behold, a woman in the city. What an introduction, a woman in the city. Now, a little later, we learn the name of Simon, and of course, we know the name of the Lord Jesus, but the most important lady in this story, the, the one who tells us the key pretty much to the story, nope, we don't even know her name. Now, religion loves to come along and say, well, that's Mary Magdalene, but the Bible never says that. And you know the reason religion loves to call this Mary Magdalene because a little bit later we learn Mary Magdalene had devils cast out of her. And religion loves to say the reason you sin, it's the devil that makes you do it. Religions called her Mary Magdalene, but the Bible never calls her that. By the way, this is not the same story as Mary of Bethany. That will be 18 months later, and that'll be about 90 miles away. One of the greatest acts in world history when Mary anoints the body of Jesus before he goes to Calvary. But this is not the same story, and this is not the same lady. No, we don't even know her name. We'll never know her name until we get to heaven. But the one thing the Bible does tell us is that she was a woman in the city which was a sinner. 2,000 years later, Jesus reminds us in the words of God every day, she was a sinner. And, and though we, we really don't technically know what the sin was, you, you pretty much don't need to be a Rhodes Scholar to figure it out. What we do know by the end of the story is that, number one, she wasn't just a sinner. She was a big sinner. And number two, she wasn't just a big sinner. She was a famous sinner. Everybody in that courtyard, everybody in that house knew who she was and what she had done. And everybody looks at her and thinks, there goes a woman. She is the biggest sinner in this city. But you know, there's one other word that's incredibly important. Would you notice how the Bible puts it in verse 37? And behold, the woman in the city which was a sinner. Do you know why she has come? She has come to be at the feet of the one, well, kind of like the testimony we heard a few moments ago, the one who was able to take all of our sins and put them in the past tense. Oh, everybody in that courtyard is pointing at her and saying, she's a sinner. I know what she does. I know where she goes. I know what she is like. But the Bible doesn't say she is a sinner. That's what religion says. The Bible says she was a sinner. Every one of her sins were gone. Every one of her sins were washed away. And while everybody is looking at the biggest, most famous sinner in the whole city and thinking she is stained and she is so wicked, the Bible tells you and the Bible tells me that every one of those sins are under the blood. The world said she is a sinner. Jesus tells us she was a sinner. And that's why she's there. She is at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 37, Behold a woman in the city which was a sinner when she knew that Jesus sat at meat at the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. Now you can watch this lady in your mind this morning standing there waiting for Jesus and now her, her not just hero, uh, not, no, not just somebody to be respected, her personal Savior that has rescued her from hell and washed her sins away is standing at the gate at the courtyard. We're Who's the person to come and give the greeting? Who is going to give him a kiss of welcome? Who is the one that's going to wash his feet and anoint his neck? There's no one there. No one there to greet him. Yet the Bible tells us she has come with an alabaster box of ointment. Ladies in New Testament times would take a very expensive box, a very small one. They'd put their best perfume in it. It had a, a little neck on the top, kind of a one breakage, a one usage thing. And oftentimes they would put it in a chain and carry it around their neck. And the Bible tells us that most precious gift, that precious alabaster box of her ointment was there. And in verse number 38, the Bible says she stood at his feet behind him and noticed the word she was weeping. Now our American eyes might read that and think, oh, okay. How would we say it? The tears begin to fill her eyes. And she has watched Jesus be humiliated and disgraced and ashamed. Maybe not like you would see it or I might see it. Certainly, though, in the days of the New Testament. And the Bible said she stood there weeping.
weeping. We might picture a lady with maybe a tear coming down its uh, cheek and, and someone kind of shaking a bit, but that's not the correct term. No, when the Bible said she stood at his feet behind him weeping, that would describe the behavior people would do at funerals where they would weep and they would screech and they would wail and they would cry. Why, when someone died in New Testament times, they would literally hire professional mourners and women would come to the funerals and do nothing but screech and weep and cry. Hi, they would hire professional flutists and they wouldn't play beautiful music like we heard from the orchestra. They would play ear screeching music just like running your fingernails down a chalkboard. You know, everybody under the age of 30 has no idea what that sounds like. That's not good. And it was screeching and it was ear piercing, it was horrific. And no, when she's at the feet of the Lord Jesus and she begins to weep, all of a sudden you couldn't help but notice and everybody's eyes are on her and she can't contain it. She is screeching and weeping and wailing and crying. And if that weren't enough, the Bible says she began to wash his feet with tears. Now we might picture one tear off of this cheek and one tear off of that cheek. But no, that word wash is how the New Testament describes a rainstorm. It is a torrent of tears. This lady is shaking and she is weeping and she is screeching and screaming and the tears are rolling down her cheeks, flowing on the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And why when you think it couldn't get any more embarrassing, when you think it couldn't get any worse, all of a sudden the unthinkable happens because it says she did wipe them with the hairs of her head. Did you see what she just did? That lady let her hair down in public. Okay, that's not a big problem here this morning looking around, but it was back then. Remember that massive religious rule book, half the size of the U.S. tax code? One of the rules in the rule book pretty much said, if you're a female, thou shalt not let your hair down in public. Why you let your hair down? The first time a man saw his wife with her hair down, that would have been on their wedding night. The rule book said that if a woman let her hair down in public, her husband could divorce the woman and without financial settlement. I mean, you're talking about one of the big ones here. You're talking about one of the horrific crimes here. And the Bible says that right there in this courtyard in public, in front of no less the Pharisees and the rest of the community, the woman let her hair down. And when you think, well, it just can't get any worse than that. Nope, it does get worse. The Bible says that she wiped them with the hairs of her head. And if that weren't bad enough, she kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Or to get to the quick of the matter, she touched him. She touched, she just touched him. And not only did she touch him, she kissed him. And not only did she kiss him, she kissed his feet. And even today, we understand what Middle Eastern people think about the feet. I mean to tell you, you talk about violations. I mean, if you were there keeping track, you couldn't keep track fast enough. She is violating rule after rule after rule. I mean, I got to tell you, I'm not saying this ever happened. But if you would want an example of somebody breaking the rules about the only way to break the rules bigger than this, about the only thing, and, and I'm not saying this happened, but if you were ever reading in the Bible and you saw Jesus say at a well in a place called Samaria, And if he actually drank of a Samaritan's woman's cup, oh, I got to tell you, that would be about the bigger violation you could imagine. Left and right, this woman is violating the Pharisee's rule book. More than that, she is putting on a public display and everybody's eyes are open. Everybody's mouths are open. People are absolutely stunned. They are looking at this lady doing all of these things. And I may have forgotten to mention it earlier. She was a sinner. What a moment in time. Now the Bible tells us a woman has just shown you and me how to stand up for the name and the fame of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because everywhere we go, every single day, the name of our Savior is dragged through the mud. The testimony of our Savior is taunted and mocked. We can't go anywhere in our society, but Jesus' name, it is used in profanity, is used as a curse word, and people despise Him, and people hate Him. And now all of a sudden, you and I have been shown how to stand up for the name, and for the fame, and for the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the question is, who in the state of Indiana is going to stand up this week and say, not on my watch? 
And if this world can mock my Savior, if the kids at school can laugh at Jesus, if the people on the job can use his name as a curse word, if this world can taunt him and mock him and ridicule him, then somewhere in a place like Fairhaven Baptist Church, somebody's got to stand up and say, not on my job. Somebody's got to say, not in my classroom. Somebody has to say, not in our neighborhood. Somebody needs to stand up like this woman did and say, I'm going to stand for the name of Christ. I will not let my Savior be disgraced. I will not allow my Savior to be humiliated. Somebody has to love him enough to shed a tear. Somebody has to love him enough to stand for his name. Somebody has to stand up for Jesus like a soldier of the cross. And of all things, we learn how to do it from a woman who was a sinner. Well, needless to say, Mr. Simon and his buddies have a problem. And Simon begins to think in verse 39, when the Pharisee which had been him sought, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, because you might have missed this, for she is a sinner. There's religion. Jesus said she was. Her religion says she is. So do you see, here's good old Simon and his buddies over here thinking this is going to work out after all. I mean, our best laid plans didn't work, but nah, 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 it's going to be okay because forget Messiah. That's, that's off the table. Forget the Son of God. Forget the Christ. Not happening. I mean, if he were a prophet, if he were a prophet, he would have known who that lady is because we all know who she is. She is a sinner. So the Lord Jesus directs his attention to Simon in verse number 40 with the word, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And that was a, a, in Bible times a way of saying, son, I'm about ready to say something you're not going to like. Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee, and he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon, I have a little story for you. He said there was a creditor. We might call him a banker. He had two customers. One owes 50 pence and the other owes 500 pence. Now, a pence in Bible times was not a former governor of Indiana, but a pence in in Bible times is what you would earn for a day's labor. So a common worker, not a wealthy guy, not a poor personnel, but the common middle class fellow, he'd work all day long and at the end of the day he'd be given a pence. It would be enough to support a family on. So the Bible says one gentleman owes 50 pence. Can I kind of put it into our thinking? It'd be like saying he has a, a, a note on the car. The other gentleman owes 500 pence. That's pretty much like having a mortgage on the house. So you can imagine the story. The gentleman with the 50 pence note, he, he, he owes this on his, his chariot, so to speak. He comes to the banker and says, I'm sorry, I, I just can't pay the note. And you know the excuses come. And I'm sorry, but I just can't pay the bill. I can't pay the debt. So the creditor, the banker, takes out the stamp. He stamps that thing paid in full. He didn't just forgive him. Do you see the phrase? He frankly forgive him. The words frankly forgave means that he set him free from the debt. He says, you don't owe me now. You don't owe me tomorrow. You don't owe me next week. You are released from your responsibility. He didn't just forgave, forgive him temporarily. He frankly forgave him the rest of the debt. Now the man who owes on the mortgage on the house shows up. 500 pence. You can imagine the story. My little one got sick. We got hospital bills, medical bills. I, I don't know where we're going to spend the night. I don't know what we're going to do. But I can't pay my house mortgage. You're going to have to repossess and take the house. And out comes that stamp. And it's not just paid. It is paid in full. It is not just forgiven. It is frankly forgiven. He releases one man of a 50 de uh, debt note. Another of a 500 pence debt. The both are released. They are both frankly forgiven. And now Jesus asked the question, tell me therefore which of them will love him most. It's pretty simple, pretty easy. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, thou wast rightly judged. And notice in your Bible in 44, he turned to the woman and said unto Simon. He is looking at her and talking to him. Another big violation of the rule book. Can I just stop for a second? As you read the book of Luke, and for that matter, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when it comes to the religious rule book, it seems like Jesus went out of his way to break as many of those rules as he could. Now, please don't misunderstand. When it comes to God's rules, 
Not only is Jesus the only one who kept every single one of God's laws, he is the only one who could possibly keep every one of God's laws. At the end of his life, he could ask the question of his worst enemies, which of you convinceth me of sin? Not one of them had an answer. No, sir, they had nothing to say. But when it comes to the religious rule book that humans added to on a daily basis, it pretty much seems like Jesus did his best to violate every one of them. Well, the message ought to be awfully clear. Salvation is not in the religious rule book. It's in God's precious word. So Jesus, looking in him, is still talking to Simon. And, and you know, it's almost funny, the question, seest thou this woman? Do you, see the, do you see the woman? I think everybody saw the woman. He said, I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto you, her sins which are many. Isn't that beautiful? You know, the Pharisees are thinking, he doesn't even know, because if he were a prophet, he would have known who that lady is. And of course, Jesus knew the sins of that woman. Of course he did. But you know, the whole reason of this story is to show you and me that Jesus didn't only know the sins of that woman. He also knew the sins of Mr. Religion. So Jesus said, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And Jesus explains why the woman is there. And it's very important to understand this because religion is awfully quick to point at this lady and see, see, that's how you go to heaven. That lady was saved because she gave her ointment. That lady was saved because she kissed the feet of Jesus. That lady was saved because she had done all these good works. But if you notice very carefully, the Bible tells us to whom little, uh, the Bible says her sins which are many, are forgiven. It's a very distinct point that Jesus is making. She is not forgiven because she has done these things. He is saying the reason she has done these things is because she already is forgiven. She is in the state of forgiveness. That lady was not saved by her works. That lady did those good works because her sins were already gone. You say, now wait a minute. If giving money to Jesus won't get you to heaven, and if anointing the feet of Jesus with your tears because you love him won't get you to heaven, and that's very important because, as an aside, all across America this morning, people are going to sit in massive houses of religion. They're going to sway back and forth and sing choruses for 40 minutes. An hour later, 20 minutes after the singing is done, a minister is going to tell people, lift your hands towards heaven and tell Jesus that you love him. Do you know lifting your hands towards Jesus and telling him that you love him is not the same thing as repentance and faith? That is not how somebody is saved. No, we love him because he first loved us. And this morning we love him and want to do good works. And we have a heart like we heard it so well this morning. Our want to has changed. That's the perfect way to say it. I and mean, this what I used to want to do. Now that I'm saved, I want to honor him. I want to magnify him. Nobody goes to heaven because they do good works. However, good works, according to James, are incredibly important for a people who love the Lord Jesus and their sins have been washed away. We don't do good works to be saved. We do works because we are saved. And that's what brought the lady here. Oh, no, religion's looking at her, pointing that finger, saying, she is a sinner. But Jesus says, oh, no, she was a sinner. Her sins are forgiven, and that is why she is here. So you say this morning, well, if that lady was not saved by the ointment, if that lady was not saved through her tears, if that lady was not saved because she loved Jesus, then how was she saved? And you know, the Bible tells us, if we keep reading, verse 49, they that sat at meat with them began to say within themselves, who is this that forgiveth sins also? So the the people that are in the courtyard, the multitudes that have gathered, the city people that are there. Everybody has the most important question on their mind or perhaps even on their lips. Well, then how is she saved? How is she saved? Who is this that forgiveth sins also? If this woman, the worst sinner in the city, if her sins are gone, who is this that forgiveth sins also? How did she get saved? And you know, the answer for the ages is found in verse number 50. 
where the Bible tells us he said to the woman, not your ointment hath saved thee. It is not your prayers that have saved thee. It is not your gift that hath saved thee. It is not your loving Jesus that hath saved thee. My friend, because it's the same message throughout the pages of the Bible. Go back to Abraham in the book of Genesis. Go right to the end of Revelation and it's there again and again and again. And for this woman, she was not saved by her works of religion. It was your faith that hath saved thee. She had her confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. She looked at her Savior and said, a sinner like me needs a perfect Savior like that. Her faith is in Christ. That means that she is not trusting church. She is not trusting religion. She is not trusting her gifts. She is not trusting what she has said or what she has done. She is not trusting the fact that she grew up in a house of religion. No, sir, that lady is saying, my faith is in the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to heaven except through him. I am my confidence and I have my hope in the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing less and nothing more. Her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is the reason that she was saved. And 2,000 years ago, there are dozens, if not hundreds, of similar verses ringing through the pages of the Bible. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. It is the message that thunders from every corner of the Bible. It is Jesus and Jesus alone, who is not a Savior, He is the only Savior. The question this morning, is He your Savior? And if you have never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the way to heaven, that narrow straight gate, that small way to heaven, it is not found through a religion. It is not found through a minister. It is not found through a church. It is found when you bow your knee to the Lord Jesus and say, I'm the sinner. Jesus is the only Savior. I am trusting the one who died and rose again for me. Jesus, only Jesus. Is he your savior? And that brings us to the end of the story, doesn't it? But like most stories, it seems, in the book of Luke, we come to the end of the story scratching our head because the last chapter is missing. I mean, this happens all the time. Whatever happened to that second elder son in the book of Luke chapter 15? I mean, whatever happens to the guy who was sick in the the story of what's called the Samaritan? Whatever happens to these people? You know, most stories in the New Testament where we're left hanging on the cliff and one more time we get to where should be the end of the story and we're shaking our heads saying, well, whatever happened to Simon the Pharisee? And that's the point, isn't it? Because the truth is, Everybody is looking at this lady and saying, she's the worst sinner in town. I mean, she's not just a sinner. She's a sinner. A 500 pence sinner. She is a famous sinner. She is a big time sinner. But the truth is, there are two kinds of sinners in this story. Oh, certainly one was the 500 pence sinner, that lady who everybody knew how evil and disgraced she is. But there's a 50 pence sinner, isn't there? Over here, good old Simon the Pharisee, the guy who wears these long robes of religion, the guy who stands on the street corner and he can pray and he can quote scriptures. Oh, no, no, no. The guy you would look at and say, he is so righteous. He is so spiritual. Why? He looks so good on the outside. But Jesus knew him as a 50 pence sinner. And that's kind of the thing, isn't it? Because in a place like Fairhaven Baptist Church, look, I can stay in here this morning. And I can look out at a very impressive church of people. I, I can listen to a very impressive choir. I can see some impressive moms, dads, grandparents, and many impressive young people. And, and, and that's the word to me. It's impressive. And on the outside, it all looks good. But because I can stand up here this morning and look at an outward appearance and be impressed doesn't mean that's how the Lord sees it. And while I look on the outward appearance and you do as well, the Lord looketh upon the heart. And I don't know who's here this morning. For all I know, the worst sinner in the state of Indiana may have showed up. You may be here today saying 500 pence sinner. Well, I crossed that line a long time ago. I don't know, but that the worst sinner in the whole state may be in this auditorium saying, Preacher, if anybody here knew who I was, what I had done, the things I've committed, i got to tell you, I'm the worst sinner in this place times a few. And it may be the worst sinner in the whole state has showed up this morning. But you know what's also very likely, maybe more likely, is that in this building there's some 50 pence sinners. I mean... Maybe a boy or girl, you've grown up right here in this church. You went to every Sunday school class. Man, you even started in the nursery. 
You have been to every camp. You have been to every program. If you're counting revival meetings, this say you lost track. Why, you have sat through missions conferences. You have heard Pastor Dameron preach. You have sat through hundreds. If you go to a Christian school, let's make that thousands, maybe even to a Bible college. You're talking about thousands. You have been through thousands of invitations in your life, camps and missions conferences and revivals. You've heard the gospel again and again. You couldn't count how many times somebody stood right here with their arms open saying, come, let us show you from the Bible how to be saved. And so you learn, like Mr. Simon the Pharisee, how to sing it, how to quote it, how to pray it, how to say it, how to do it. You just got yourself as a nice, cute, pretty 50-pence sinner. And you know the problem with that is 50-pence sinners, and I grew up in a good church and a good family as well, we can look at 500-pence sinners and say, well, I've never done that, and I've never gone there, and I've never drank that, and I never did that, and I never said that, and I don't do that. Well, I guess I must be all right because I'm not like that 500-pence sinner, and that's the problem, isn't it? The Bible doesn't say all have sinned and come short of the 500-pence sinners. No, we don't compare ourselves to the worst sinner in town. We compare ourselves to the clean purity of God and we all come short as sinners. And I wonder this morning, there may be the worst sinner in town here, a 500 pence sinner. You're so loaded with sins, you say, what can I do? And the answer to that is you can't do anything but you can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if there's one thing we learn from this lady is that Jesus can take a big sinner and Jesus can take a famous sinner and Jesus can take your sins and put them all in the past tense. But that's the stunning thing, isn't it? The stories in the Bible that tell us that 50 pence sinners and 500 pence sinners get saved the exact same way. I mean, just like we, oh, that drunkard needs, oh, that drug addict, oh, that lady, oh, what does she need a savior to wash her? Oh, really? Well, show me a 50 pence sinner who's grown up. I never did that, never did that, never did that, never did that. But the Lord knows everything deep in your heart. And if you'll ever be saved, the only way you'll get saved is the same way that dirty Filthy 500 pence sinner got saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's another message here, isn't there? The 50 pence sinners who grow up in church and the 500 pence sinners that everybody knows, they get saved the same way. But the other thing is that 50 pence sinners and 500 pence sinners who die without Christ, they go to the same hell. So how do you know that? One of the last verses in the Bible in Revelation 21.8, it gives a list of the people that are going to be in the lake of fire forever. Things like the fearful, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars. I mean, you pretty much got the things there that make up 500 pence sinners. The drunkards and the drug addicts and the, uh, the, the immorality and all. The, I mean, the dirtiest sinners in Hollywood. Yep, they're found in Revelation 21.8. But do you know who else is found there? The 50 pence sinner who grew up at Fairhaven Baptist Church who has never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus can take the worst sinner in town, take every dirty, dark sin and turn it into past tense. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But if you die without Christ, it doesn't matter if somebody dies as the dirtiest sinner in Indiana or somebody dies as the most respectable sinner in Indiana. Hell opens up its mouth in the eternal lake of fire. Now for those who have never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's why Jesus takes it a step further in John 3, 36. If you have not believed on the Lord Jesus, it is not that one day you will face the wrath of God. No, the Bible says right here, right now, right now, as you and I see here without Christ the wrath of God is abiding on the soul of somebody who's not saved it is not one day you'll have to figure out what you're going to do it's worse than that the wrath of God is right upon you now if you saw how you stood you'd run down this aisle you'd grab brother Dameron you'd say right now I want to be saved because 50 pen sinners and 500 pen sinners have only one hope and the hope is the only one who can wash their sins away the way the truth and the life is he your savior? I know across this room there are many 500 pen sinners who could say that's what I used to be, but now it's in the past tense. There's some 50 pen sinners that have grown up in the house of God. You've grown up with saved mom and dad in a good church, and, and yet you can give the same, same testimony. I was a sinner, but those sins are gone. Jesus has saved me. 
My friend, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, what a great day to call in the name of the Lord and be saved. But if you know Him, excuse me, but you and I have just been challenged. You and I have just been shown how to stand up for the name of Jesus, to invest our life in standing for His name. I say, I don't care what a world says. I don't care what anybody thinks. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And if this world can be unashamed when it comes to mocking Him and cursing Him and taunting Him, then somebody in this room can stand up and say, then I am not ashamed of loving Him and defending Him and standing for Him. And of all things, you and I have been shown how to stand up for Jesus by a woman who was a sinner.